Kicking off at number five, Igolanak, a name that makes me realise the bizarre complexities of the Welsh language. Igolanak, also known as the Defiler, is one of the more nastier, shall we say, of the Great Old Ones. He's renowned as the god of perversion and depravity, and that's just not the human perception of taboo, but anything that can be conceived by a sane or otherwise sapient being. This guy is so ready to burst into the human plane and cause some disgusting chaos that merely speaking his name will usher him into our world, which I guess I bet Best stop saying his name then. The Defiler's true form is uncertain, but when he possesses a human host, he appears as a grotesquely obese man, lacking a head and neck and a gaping mouth in the palm of each hand. He seeks those that read perverse and forbidden literature, offering the summoner the otherwise dubious honour of becoming his priest or just simply eating them. Next up at number four, Cthilla. Also known as the Kraken or the Secret One, Cthilla is one of the twisted offspring of Cthulhu and Idya. She has the appearance of a gigantic red bodied black ringed and six eyed octopus with small wings, so I guess she kind of takes after her father. Similarly, like Cthulhu, she can alter her body's proportions at will. Cthulhu's first major appearance was in his daughter's Darkling Womb, written by Tina Algens, where she was captured by marine researchers believing her to be a rare specimen of an undiscovered octopus species. Obviously, as you can imagine, it didn't go well. She also appears in the Hall of the Yellow King by Peter Rawlick in her humanoid form of a young girl as a possible bride for the unspeakable one, Hastur. The thing that makes Cthulhu so important though and the reason why she's so heavily guarded by her cultists and followers is that should Cthulhu somehow die, his secret daughter Cthulhu will give birth to him once again. How's that for a pushy parent? Coming in at number three, Dagon. Also known as Father Dagon, this guy is pretty damn huge when it comes to fishy amphibious cults. Dagon is an enormous deity that presides over the Deep Ones, the fish-like race indigenous to the Earth's oceans, and the ones responsible for the weird goings on in Innsmouth, the basis for most of Lovecraft's fictional work. First seen in his titular short story, Dagon, he's mentioned extensively throughout the Cthulhu mythos in the ranks of the Great Old Ones, alongside his consort and mate, Mother Hyde. He is worshipped by the esoteric order of Dagon, a shadowy cult based in Innsmouth that go to great lengths to maintaining the existence of their ocean dwelling god. Make no mistake about it, Father Dagon is absolutely huge, dwarfing the size of ancient whales. While apparently immortal, his eternal lifespan may actually be attributed to his relationship with the Star Spawn, a cosmic race of Cthulhu like beings who sometimes select formidable specimens from a given species to protect, nurture, and improve power for seemingly reasons known only to them. Swinging in at number two, Gatanathoa, aka the Dark God, or if you're being more precise, literally the most grotesque and ugliest creature in the entire Cthulhu mythos. And that's saying something. Gatanathoa is the firstborn of Cthulhu, spawned by Idya on the planet Zoth, whose origin is first laid out in The Thing in the Pit by Lynn Carter. He is a huge amorphous monstrosity whose appearance is so hideous that anyone who gazes upon it is literally petrified into a living cadaver. The victim is permanently immobilised, the body taking on the consistency of leather, yet the real kicker, their brain is preserved indefinitely and remains fully aware. Wow. What a way to go. The Dark God was brought to Earth from the planet Yugoth, assisted by an ancient alien race, possibly the bug-like Migo. On Earth, they built a colossal fortress atop Mount Yadith Go on the lost continent of Mu, and they sealed Gatanathoa inside the mountain, where it remains to this day, worshipped by a strange secret cult. No thank you. And finally, our number one spot, Hastur. And really, it has to be. Sorry. The Cthulhu mythos has no place for puns, especially when we're addressing the name of Hastur the Unspeakable, perhaps the most bleak and utterly evil entity in the entirety of Lovecraftian fiction. Him who is not to be named, the King in Yellow and the Yellow Sign. Although he is most famously associated with Lovecraft, Hastur is only ever mentioned once in The Whisperer of Darkness. He was originally a creation of Ambrose Bierce and also appears in the 1895 horror collection The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. 
Asta is defined as a great old one, but there is potentially much more to him. He is the spawn of yogg sothoth and the half-brother of Cthulhu. He is also possibly the magnum in ominandum, the overarching mystery of the Lovecraft mythos that culminates as the nameless mist. Hasta appears in several vile forms, the feaster from afar, a black shriveled flying monstrosity dripping with tentacles tipped with razor sharp talons that pierce a victim's skull and siphon out their brain. And also the king in yellow which was also referenced in the mesmerising first season of True Detective. Time is a flat circle, check it out. Defeat my fancy, it is man's relation to the cosmos, to the unknown which alone arouses in me the spark of creative imagination. Kicking off at number 5, Luke Cthu. And what better way to start off this list than with the mother of all old gods herself, Luke Cthu. Also known as Lu Cthu, or as a much more horrifying title, The Birth Womb of the Great Old Ones. This twisted, pulsating mass of a mother was created by James Ambule, with its one and only appearance in the 1998 short story, Correlated Contents. Which makes the very little that we do know about it even more terrifying. It poses the question, what does this hulking cosmic entity have in store for us? Well, Lukathu appears as a colossal conglomeration of innards spanning the size of a large planetary body. Imagine the planet Mars, but instead of a rocky desert like surface, it's made up of skin and flesh and whatever else lies beneath. Lukathu possesses a strange, slimy outer surface covered in countless thousands of pulsating pustules, which in fact are biological incubators, each containing a great old one in its larval stage. Basically, each one of its warts contains a small, sprightly little baby Cthulhu, or worse, and it's currently unknown how often these entities reach maturity. Hopefully for us, it's not a regular occurrence. Gross, right? Next up at number 4, Groth, which kind of sounds like the sound you make when you do a sick burp, right? Groth, also known as the Harbinger, is an all-powerful outer god that floats without purpose across the endless cosmic abyss, like some malevolent, omniscient nuclear karaoke ball. Groth is the size of a moon and coloured in a rusty shade of orange, all encompassed by an enormous terrifying red eye, which often closes to avoid the detection of any nearby hostile entities. It has appeared twice in the Cthulhu mythos, first in the 1976 short story The Tugging by Ramsey Campbell, and later in 2004 in the Call of Cthulhu RPG game Splatbook The Stars Are Right. Groth spends eternity simply drifting throughout the cosmos, while terrifyingly singing its strange song, The Music of the Spheres. It serves a simple function. Whenever Groth nears a planet, any dormant great old one or outer god on the world will respond to its song and awaken, almost always resulting in the destruction of the planet, the annihilation of all life or both. In one Lovecraftian instance, Groth was indirectly responsible for awakening the great old one known as the worm that gnaws in the night, who proceeded to consume the alien planet of Shagai from the inside out. Pretty metal, eh? Coming in at number 3, Shub Niggurath. You betcha, aka the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, an outer god who is the very definition of how messed up the Lovecraftian universe can get. Just like Lukathu, she is a perverse fertility deity, responsible for belching forward some of the vilest creatures in the whole of the Cthulhu mythos. She appears as an evil cloud-like entity, an enormous mass which extrudes black tentacles, slime dripping mouths, and more strangely than any other, sure right goat legs. She is the wife of the not to be named one, don't ask, and the wife of yogg -Sothoth, who spawned forth the twins Nub and Yeb. Across the entire mythos, shub Niggurath is probably the most extensively worshipped by hundreds of twisted alien cultures and even druidic and barbaric cults on earth. Her dark young are horrifying, pitch black monstrosities seemingly comprised of ropey tentacles who stand as tall as a tree on a pair of stumpy, you guessed it again, hoofed legs. Also her milk, yes you heard that correctly, her milk is often used in cult ceremonies, mutating those that drink it into fierce spawns of her brood. Nevertheless, she's seen as one of the most horrific creatures in horror fiction, being referenced several times by both Stephen King and Terry Pratchett, even making her way referentially into the Doctor Who universe. She's a pretty big deal, put it that way. Next up at number 2, Wilbur Waitley. This guy makes my number 2 spot simply because when I first read The Dunwich Horror, a short story by H.P. Lovecraft written 
Jensen way back when in 1928. For me, he was the most terrifying character throughout the whole damn thing, even more so than his twin brother, the titular Dunwich Horror, who, if we're being honest, was just the sad, misunderstood result of a mad woman and an outer god. Have some sympathy, guys. Wilbur Waitley was born in the rural town of Dunwich, Massachusetts, near the city of Arkham, where most Lovecraftian fiction takes place. The date of his birth was noted as the night before the hills rumbled and the dogs barked incessantly, which was telling because dogs continued to show an instinctual hatred for Wilbur the remainder of his life. Good job, doggos. We can always rely on you. Let's not glean over it. Wilbur Waitley was a pretty ugly dude. The reason being that, well, he was made up of outer godness. As a child, he was described as a dark, goatish looking infant and displayed an unnatural physical and mental development. He could walk unassisted at seven months and talk at 11 months. At the age of four, he began growing facial hair. If you've seen the 1970 B movie, then you'll know what we're getting at because that final reveal where Wilbur disintegrates into the floor, yeah, that's not nice. And finally, at number one, Nyar Lathotep. Because let's be real, no other entity in the Cthulhu mythos is as innately evil as our good old friend Dr. Nyar Lathotep. The big bad himself, the ancient evil that walks on two legs and has many names. The Black Wind, the Crawling Mist, the Haunter of the Dark, the God of the Bloody Tongue. You may not know it, but this guy is pretty much the culmination of every evil fictional overlord since his first appearance in Lovecraft's 1920 prose poem of the same name. He is a creature that carries many masks, but usually appears as a tall, handsome, joyous man with welcoming features. All of this is a ruse, however, as told in 1932's The Dreams in the Witch House. He has a thousand other forms that will immediately invoke madness to whoever witnesses him. It's strange because out of most of the outer gods who are evil and all powerful but never really demonstrate a clear purpose or agenda, Naya Latotep seems to be deliberately deceptive and manipulative, operating a clear agenda to achieve his twisted goals and making him the most human-like amongst all the outer gods. His one true goal is to spread madness, which is more enjoyable than death and destruction, and it is often suggested in the Cthulhu mythos that eventually he will destroy the entirety of the human race while laughing like a mad man. Well, let's hope not, eh? And guess what? Still not a sniff of Cthulhu. Why? Because we're better than that. Cthulhu's been done to death. He's the Taylor Swift of the great old ones. Don't worry, guys. We've got you. Kicking off at number five, Zoth Amog. An entity that really lives up to its namesake of being weird, amorphous, and full of tentacles. Zoth Amog, also known as the Dweller in the Depths, is a great old one whose first appearance was in 1975's Out of the Ages by Lynn Carter, who then later emerged in Brian Lumley's Titus Crow series. Zoth Amog is described as being distortedly cone-shaped and having four sucker-lined arms similar to that of a starfish, apexed with a tooth-filled maw and a great mane of tentacles. Zoth Amog was spawned as the third son of Cthulhu and Idia, untold eons ago in the binary star system of Zoth. His brood brothers and sisters are Gatanathoa, Ithogtha, and Cthulhu, and along with their father Cthulhu, they all shipped off to Earth. Eventually, Zothamog was defeated in the long war with the Elder Gods, and he was imprisoned deep beneath the seabed near his father's tomb in the dead city of Relier. He waits there for eternity, whispering into the darkness, waiting to cast his will into the dreams of mankind. Much like his dad. Coming in at number four, Ihort. First appearing in the 1980 Ramsey Campbell novel Before the Storm, although appearing in reference notes since the late 60s, Ihort is quite the mysterious great old one. And that's saying something because, as you know, these guys are pretty elusive. Here's something to sum this guy up. His name is derived from the German word I, meaning egg, and Horten, which means hoard. Yeah, he's a walking, clicking sack of great old one babies. Gross. Ihort, also known as the God of the Labyrinth, lives in an endless network of caverns and tunnels situated beneath the Severn Valley in England, which is near where I grew up. No thank you. Ihort appears as an enormous gelatinous blob supported on hundreds of tiny bone-like legs. Its whole body is covered in a shifting, writhing mass of eyes which constantly disperse and reform at random. The real kicker though is the reason for Ihort's existence. It lives for the sole purpose of capturing humans who stray into its realm. Once it captures a poor, hopeless, unfortunate victim, it offers them a bargain. Either they allow Ihort to implant its young into their still living 
living body and eventually after incubation burst into a disgusting brood of its vile babies or be immediately and violently gruesomely consumed. Yeah, I think I'll take the latter. Next up at number three, Ithakua. Otherwise known as the Wind Walker or the God of the Cold White Silence, Ithakua is the Lovecraftian equivalent of both the Wendigo and the Yeti, yet like with many of these terrifying great old ones, he's a thousand feet tall and inspires horror on a cosmic scale. Ithakua is an enormous humanoid with webbed feet and glowing red eyes who frequently stalks the Arctic wilderness, preying on the unwary and the unfortunate. Many of those who live in Ithakua's hunting grounds leave sacrifices in a stark effort to appease the beast, but as you can guess, it's never very successful. Anyone who is unfortunate enough to be caught by Ithakua are dragged off to his true home, the ice-ridden planet of Boria, where he aims to swell his growing band of worshippers. It gets weirder though because Ithakua will then attempt to mate with any females by inserting a psychic seed into their womb, inevitably developing into a great old one offspring. He aims that one day one of these terrifying children will help in destroying their true enemy, the Elder Gods, though historically this hasn't gone too well and Athakua still waits for his true terrifying heir. Well, we said it before, but the great old ones are some pushy parents. Swinging in at number two, Yig. And if you've got a fear of snakes, you may want to look away for this one. Yig, also known as the father of serpents, or even more conveniently, the snake god, has a pretty straightforward role in the pantheon of the great old ones, although it's in his method where the real fear lies. Yig manifests as a gigantic snake with the arms of a man, although he sometimes appears as a bizarre reptilian humanoid. Lizard people. Am I right? Yig is considered to be the god of snakes and serpents everywhere, and his fierce devotion to his children is the source of his wrath. When he emerges from his sleep, his sole purpose is to punish those who have harmed his serpentine brood. In The Curse of Yig, written in 1929 by Zelia Bishop and edited by H.P. Lovecraft himself, a couple from Arkansas moves to Oklahoma in search of a better life in the late 1800s. Unfortunately for them though, the husband has a fear of snakes, and his wife deliberately destroys a nest of newborn rattlesnakes to ease his phobia. Well, yeah, bad news. And Yig sends swarms of his children to attack the couple, killing their dog in the process. In the end, to ultimately take his vengeance, Yig forces the woman to kill her own husband with an axe before transforming her into a part human, part reptile monstrosity, cursing her to wriggle on her belly like a snake for all eternity. Yikes. And finally, our number one spot, Azatoth, the big guy himself, and the fact that it's taken us three videos to finally reach this guy is saying something. Now, you see, it's difficult because Azatoth isn't a great old one or elder god. He's an outer god, and that means that he doesn't concern himself with the likes of Cthulhu and his brood. He's an intangible horror, an entity that lurks in the darkest depths of space, writhing in an eternity of cosmic torment. Also known as the nuclear chaos, the demon sultan, and the blind idiot god, Azatoth's first appearance was in an unfinished 500 word short story written by Lovecraft in 1922 which would later be transformed into the dream quest of unknown Kadath. Azatoth exists outside reality and there can be no definite description as everyone envisions his ever-changing visage differently. He gave birth to the darkness, the nameless mist Naya Lathotep and spat forth yog Satoth. In the insects from Shagai by Ramsey Campbell, his worshippers are many. And in a forest temple in the Goatswood, his cultists worship an idol carved in his image, a horrible, bestial, mouthless face with deep sunk eyes and covered in glistening black hair. As far as Lovecraftian entities are concerned, they don't get much more cosmically terrifying than Azatoth, a creature so vile that even uttering his name can drive people to madness. I guess I best shut up then. <laughs>